Welcome, participants of the World Investment Forum, to this session on climate disclosure, where we will be reviewing the work of the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures, TCFD. If that's not an acronym you've heard before, you will hear it a lot during this session. Uh, the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures was a task force of the Financial Stability Board, the FSB. Uh, and we are very pleased to have uh, one of the actual members of the task force with us today, Liam Sim from the Singapore Exchange, uh, as well as representatives from the exchange community, from the regulatory, regulatory community, uh, IOSCO, and also from the standard setting community from CDSB. Uh, and we're also pleased to have our, our partners, the IFC, that the Sustainable Stock Exchange Initiative has been working with for some time now to deliver training on climate disclosure around the world uh, at many exchanges around the world. And uh, so I'm very pleased to introduce Martine to, uh, to moderate the session. And I'd like to introduce Martine just by saying that Martine works at the IFC, but she, in her previous life, she spent many years working in the exchange industry herself. So she is deeply familiar with the work of this industry and of course, passionate about uh, sustainable finance. So Martine, over to you. Thank you, Anthony. And absolutely, I'm very happy to be uh, moderating this panel uh, today. So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you who have uh, tuned in to this session. Uh, climate change is now at the top of the global political agenda. Politicians, regulators, and financial market actors are more than ever trying to address what climate change, mean, what climate change means for our society as a whole, and how capital markets participants can be leveraged to help companies become more climate resilient. As global financial markets take steps towards better integrating climate risks and opportunities in pricing mechanisms, disclosure provides the bedrock for progress in the pursuit of a more sustainable global economy. Therefore, there is a growing interest for climate-specific reporting enabled by robust regulatory standards. Some of the example is for the creation of the Task Force on Nature-Related Financial Disclosures, uh, the development of the UN SEC Model Guidance on Climate Disclosure for Stock Exchanges, the EU's Legislative Proposal on Corporate Sustainability Reporting, and the IFRS Foundation's drive to create international sustainability standards um, uh, requirements. So stock exchanges are uniquely positioned to advance climate disclosure through market guidance. It can support consistency and standardization of information that enables both local and global progress in climate reporting and the use of climate related data. Stock exchanges infrastructure, networks, and experience can contribute to addressing climate change via capital markets. A newly published UN SEC model guidance on TCFD adoption assists exchanges and markets in implementing TCFD recommendations. This shows how exchanges can lead by example to make markets more climate resilient. Since 2005, IFC has supported the preparation of 145 codes, laws, and regulations, 40 scorecards on corporate governance and sustainability, and 11 ESG reporting guidelines. And the request from stock exchanges and regulators for tailored technical support is growing, particularly related to climate. Last year alone, we supported the development of 20 ESG regulations. Our latest collaboration with the UNSSC aims to help the Johannesburg Stock Exchange develop their first ESG reporting guidance and supplement on climate, on climate disclosure using the UNSSC model guidance and IFC's flagship tools on disclosure and transparency. Very happy and looking forward to, to hear from Shamila from the GSC today on this panel. In order to provide markets with high quality training on climate disclosure and, presents, and present an overview of this TCFD recommendations, the UNSCC, IFC, and CDSB are providing multifaceted CDP certified courses to issuers and other key stakeholders. It is important for companies to disclose information on climate risk to their investors. The premise of disclosure on material climate risk and opportunities to investor is important to allow them to align their investments with the Paris Agreement, ensure that risk and opportunities are correctly priced into valuation and allocate capital efficiently. I'm very honored to be joined by five esteemed panelists today uh, as follows. So we have Jonathan Bravo, 
Head of Finance, IT, and Senior Policy Advisor at Endosco. David Harris, Global Head of Sustainable Finance, Data, and Analytics at the London Stock Exchange Group. Leanne Simio, Special Advisor at the Singapore Stock Exchange and member of the TCFD. Shamila Subramoni, Chief Sustainability Officer at Johannesburg Stock Exchange. And Marty McBrien, Managing Director, Climate Disclosure Standards Board. So let's kick off our discussion. I will start first with Jonathan. Uh, IOSCO has come out strongly in favor of the proposed IFRS International Sustainability Standards Board. What is the reason for this? And what do you see as the benefit of co-locating financial and sustainability reporting? Thank you very much, um, Martin, for the introduction. And of course, uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you. And thank you very much, Anthony and the SSB Initiative team for the invitation. I'm really pleased to take part here today, of course, IOSCO includes a number of stock exchanges as part of its membership, so I'm really glad to be speaking. Um, and it's really, of course, uh, you know, uh, very, very much a pleasure to be part of this distinguished panel. So as uh, you have noted, Martin, um, uh, in, in, our, in the IOSCO report uh, on issuer sustainability reporting that we published in June this year, we shared our vision for a global comprehensive corporate reporting system, which was really predicated on three pillars one of them being uh, encouraging the establishment of the International Sustainability Standards Board under the IFRS Foundation. And there are several reasons for, for this. Uh, the first one is that we believe that the IFRS Foundation offers the most credible solution to resolve the alphabet soup and transition from what you know, is uh, until now a very fragmented landscape with multiple framework providers. Mark is probably better placed to elaborate on, on, on this, uh, but in the, in the last few years, um, the sustainability standard providers, the main players really arrived at the conclusion and coalesced around the notion of some sort of integration with the IFRS Foundation, as this was reflected, I think, in the various statements by the Group of Five or the Alliance. And in my view, this was really a critical uh, step that really set a direction of travel. And I'm probably not uncovering anything uh, new, uh, reminding that the IFRS Foundation has really built a reputation in the last couple of decades of being able to set global standards that are uh, you know, broadly accepted by the market, both from the private and public sectors. Uh, 20 years ago, I also embarked on a similar crusade uh, you know, in order to set international financial reporting standards. And we entrusted the IFRS Foundation to deliver this. And as of today, we, all we can say is we really think they have delivered. And you know, let me just remind that their standards are being used by over 140 jurisdictions, and they effectively become law in many of our regulatory frameworks. So for all of us uh, you know, in the business of setting international standards, uh, you know, we do have a good understanding of how challenging it is to set standards that can operate across jurisdictions in an effective manner. Let me highlight perhaps a couple of other aspects. One is, of course, you know, and this is very key to, to IOSCO, is our appreciation of the sound governance structure of the IFRS Foundation. Its three-tier model uh, is probably the best formulation to achieve a public interest outcome. It has an independent technical board that follows a transparent, participatory, inclusive due process, which is subject to the oversight of a group of trustees that are representative of all stakeholder groups and regions and they are ultimately and in turn accountable to public authorities through the monitoring board, which is now chaired by IOSCO. So perhaps on a more technical note, um, and I mentioned before our June report, we conducted quite extensive outreach and we very uh, clearly heard from investors that in addition to the shortcomings they appreciated around the quality, the consistency, comparability of, of uh, uh, disclosures, there, there is, and, and, and you know, let me just use you know, present tense because it's still a situation right now, a disconnect between sustainability factors and financial performance. And this is something that definitely users want to see. Um, and this is of course, another key reason for us putting our eyes on the IFRS Foundation, having the I, ISSB to sit alongside and have a close interface with the ISB can really pro provide a coherent framework and internal consistency to deliver this connectivity. Another factor, and I know the topic of the day is uh, TCFD implementation, is of course the fact that the ISSB proposals are grounded on the notion of incorporating the best of breed from existing frameworks, including the TCFD, 
also the CDSB is also a fundamental element for, for us. And I'm sure this will, we'll touch on this later on in the panel, but this is a guarantee that the resources that have been invested so far by companies, preparers, regulators, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and this journey can be leveraged to rapidly progress into a more comprehensive and granular framework as TCFD acknowledged in their status reports that we were still not arriving at the level of consistency that was needed. And we think that the ISSB can provide the level of granularity to underpin uh, this. So uh, all in all, if I can summarize that we believe that the ISSB is really well placed to deliver a global baseline um, uh, that can be uh, adopted across jurisdictions, but that is also flexible enough to allow jurisdictions to build specific uh, requirements to address the broader needs of a wider, uh, wider group of stakeholders. I really spoken on the first pillar about our, our vision, but I'm sure uh, uh, you know the uh, uh, other panelists will touch on that. So let me stop here and turn back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. I think this is uh, kicking off us uh, very nicely. And now moving to to David, uh, the London Stock Exchange was one of the co-chairs of the SEC's model guidance. Is a founder and a founder member of the recently launched Net Zero Financial Service Providers Alliance and has committed to publish the CFD reporting guidance for LSE listed issuers by the end of the year. How does the London Stock Exchange Group see its role in supporting the net zero transition? Thanks, Martina, and, and, and hello, everybody. It's, it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you for, for, for organizing this session. Um, and um, so maybe by just by way of context, maybe it's just worth just explaining a little bit about setting out kind of the the London Stock Exchange Group organization and then maybe I can come on and and pick up the point um, Martin that you just raised um, so we we have three kind of main areas of business one is what we call capital markets which is where London Stock Exchange resides we have a um, we also have a, a post trade business which which um, with LCH clear Net and provides all the kind of settlement and clearing, and then we've got the kind of the data analytics and index business and, and Refinitiv, uh, and Elsa came together earlier this year into one organisation. We were five thousand people; they were twenty thousand people. So we've been going through a, a big organisational shift. But so we're really kind of a market infrastructure and data analytics business and and these issues around climate and sustainability data and the interconnection between kind of corporates and reporting and the investor and finance needs is really central to a, to a lot of to in fact all, all three of those different business areas um, and so this is this is a really important 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 work that the UN sustainable stock exchange is doing also what we, what we have just heard from IOSCO as well um, maybe I set out a little bit and what I see is um, you know what's happening in the market a little bit on 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 um, on, on the, and on the challenges there, how we're kind of addressing it, and then and then the barriers which which which, are, which we're addressing here. So, um, what is happening? You know, there we are actually going through a, a fundamental and incredible shift in the business and finance sector. You know, the transition to to a net zero economy is, is huge and is well underway. Um, investors in the finance sector are moving, businesses are moving, we're seeing huge alliances coming together with things like GFANS uh, and the commitments to, to, to net zero. And so that's incredibly exciting and, and there is massive momentum. Um, so that's, that's, that's the kind of the, the good news. Um, the bad news is that actually, you know, even so emissions are likely to go up globally over the course of this decade when they need to be coming down massively. Um, we're not going fast enough despite all of this incredible momentum. So what does business and the finance sector need to deliver? Well, there's really kind of two pieces to it. One part is we need to be able to support the growth of green industries and the green economy. How do we help scale the solutions to all of this and, how, you know, and, the, and fund the innovation and drive the changes there? The other part is is supporting transition across all sectors of the economy, including high carbon sectors. How do we help all of those that yeah, all of those high carbon sectors transition and and the whole economy transition and not and and also deal with kind of yeah, all the kind of the social issues I think there as well with the just transition and making sure we're not leaving communities and you know and, and parts of the world kind of um, uh, you know yeah, left out of this. How can we, how can we shift? Um, 
Now, to be able to, to achieve all of that, there's kind of two things that are needed. One is, well, two particular things. One, at which I, where I think there are potential barriers. One is around, um, there are real barriers around data. You know, the investment and finance community want to shift, but frankly, a lot of the data and analytics you know, is, is not good enough. We need much higher quality, more consistent, more comparable, more global data sets. Um, and we need, and the other piece of it is we need better understanding and dialogue, communication between different siloed bits of the market. Often the, the, you know, the business community don't really understand you know, what is affecting investment allocation decisions. The, the investor side don't really uh, feel that a lot of the business community get it and are providing the data that they need. Uh, so we need to solve those challenges. And that's what's so exciting about, I think, what you know, exchanges coming together, working together through, through this work of the UN Sustainable Stock Exchange, developing this model guidance so that exchanges can be engaging their companies and their markets in a really consistent way on climate we've got cl clear framework through tcfd we can try and drive and work together to help support that you know we have been asking for many years iosco to step into the fray here delighted that they are now are and and our ifrs we need their support to try and help drive consistency at the same time you know we don't we we need to be supporting that, making it happen as fast as quickly, but we shouldn't also be waiting for everything to be solved. We, we've got enough where we can be working on this already. We've got enough clarity on, on the data. So, um, so yeah, I guess that's some of the background. What we've, it, you mentioned about the commitment that we would launch our guidance before the end of the year, which was our commitments. I am delighted to say that we launched it yesterday. So we've done it. Um, so <laughs> thank you. Um, and so uh, we have we've had two big things actually just in the last couple of days. Um, one has been um, trying to make sure we've got academic rigor behind the analysis of net zero analysis uh, study uh, work. So we've um, we've funded um, the expansion of, of TPI. This is the Transition Pathway Initiative. They feed their data into CA100 plus this kind of big engagement initiative. Uh, the London School of Economics is going to set up a, a global TPI climate transition centre. Um, and and on Tuesday we announced that we would, you know, alongside a number of other funders, will help fund that that academic expansion. Um, and then the piece yesterday was the launch of the support for companies on London stock exchange markets. And that was three things. It was the the climate guidance, based off the UN SSE model guidance. Um, a second piece was a climate governance score based on that TPI management quality score. So we're providing that privately to companies so they can understand how they stack up. Maybe we can come back and talk more about some of that later. Um, and then um, finally, um, linking in with the guidance, which which you've very kindly been supporting and, and the USSC also kind of trying to then make sure that London listed companies also have access to that to that training, uh, which is being provided. Let me stop there. Sorry, I've probably spoken for too long. Martin, back to you. Yeah. Thank you, David. Well, congratulations in launching that, and, and I hope we can hear a little bit more on your client. Uh, sorry, your climate uh, uh, score. It seems uh, governance score. It seems very interesting. Uh, Shamila, let's go uh, to you now. Um, the Johannesburg Stock Exchange was the uh, other co-chair of the model uh, guidance work. What has the exchange done or is doing uh, in respect to encouraging climate disclosure in South Africa? And what are some of the local nuances that need to be considered? Thank you very much, Martine, and good day to everybody on the line. Uh, such a pleasure to be here. Um, thank you, too, for the sponsors, the partnership, IFC, CDSB. Uh, very grateful for the help that you're giving just generally for the exchange world. So that's uh, something I think that many exchanges will benefit from as we see the transition happening ahead of regulation and the markets are feeling the impact already. Uh, so, Martin, you know, a question about what the exchange is doing. I think the first point is that, well, there's so much that seems to have happened really in the last two years, if you think about how there's been this exponential change recently, and the temperature change as well as the foul change just in terms of the pressure, right, coming down on companies and things like that. The exchange's effort in the space goes back uh, to the early 2000s. So, you know, on these issues and on sustainability generally, which is the departure point of the JSE, the work goes back uh, quite, quite way back. So 
we have had been looking at disclosure broadly in sustainability as far back as 2004. If I just look at the index that we had in the market at that stage, the broad-based sustainability index that we had worked on there. And of course, those are the pillars of the ES and the G that underpin that and, and is actually encouraging disclosure in the market. Of course, we've also had from the governance perspective, uh, the King codes, which have you know for the longest time been considered one of the foremost governance codes in the world, embedded as part of the listings requirements. And of course, the regime around that has changed over time time currently it's apply and explain but king explicitly acknowledges the you know and by people planet profit perspective and the need for companies to con to apply their minds to material issues including those in their disclosure so the exchange while it hasn't been prescriptive in terms of you need to do this these are the mandatory disclosures on on climate change for example has actually had a slightly different approach in our market and so ours has been more voluntary um, more kind of a moral suasion perspective and was taking the markets along a journey. If you look at the sectors on the JSE directly from an exposure perspective, uh, we come from a part of the world that has a lot of a kind of, there's, there's a lot of mining activity, unless so there's a resource intensive economy that has changed in profile, of course, quite a bit over the last number of years, as has the rest of the world to go to more service oriented economy. But this, the, the, nevertheless, the impact is still there. And, and trapped within that are the issues around things like the just transition, uh, because we're also a country with a massive amount of inequality and uh, where, you know, and probably one of the highest unemployment rates in the world as well. So the felt impact of things that we're talking about with the transition and with climate change are quite different to possibly come from the Northern Hemisphere country. So I'm combining the answer to your question around local nuances, but the contextualization, I think hopefully will then make a lot of sense to the approach that the exchange has taken. So we're fully cognizant of the fact that there's risk embedded in the market um, and that really to have long-term resilience in our companies, the sustainability agenda is an imperative one for them. And uh, so those efforts go back, like I said, to go back on, on climate change in particular, we're one of the first markets in the world where CDP, for example, was adopted and has consistently been one of the highest CDP response rates in the world. So there has been a culture embedded in our market of good governance practices and adopting best practices generally. And if you look at CDP, there's also a number of A-listers that are coming from South Africa, notwithstanding the profile of the sectors that are there. So the effort you, you can see has been there. And then of course, when we transitioned our model on our, that underpinned our ESG index to partner with FTSE Russell, which of course now sits under the LSEC banner as well, um, then that was the adoption of the FTSE for good model in our market. And that was an assessment that the exchange um, it basically partnered with FTSE to do on around about our top 100 issuers and um, and that has been also had the had the effect of being um, creating aspiration because their indices that are created on the back of those ratings and highest rated companies on ESG then become part of indices and so the actual effect of having that in the market has been to encourage better disclosure also because what has underpinned that is the is the notion that anything that is considered for ESG rating has to be publicly disclosed so what we're doing is really taking our fundamental approaches to enable a better environment for sustainability disclosures and practices to grow and to develop and to flourish and to say how do we work around the different elements and levers that we have to enable that in the market. And so when you look at that perspective and then you think back about, okay, so what is the impact of this been? So there isn't direct regulation, no mandatory disclosure, unlike a lot of the other countries where regulation is a lot tougher. The FTSE Russell did a, a webinar for us uh, just a re very recently, in fact, and looked at the average ESG rating across all the markets that they rate. And South Africa came out number five in the world for average ESG score. And that is an emerging market without mandatory frameworks for disclosure, uh, you know, that are prescriptive in that regard. So you can see that the impact over time of the exchange looking at voluntary initiatives, pushing the agenda, changing to, you know, mandatory, sorry, public only disclosure has had an impact that has been possibly unexpected but actually I think quite commendable. So if we look at it, it's not like our companies have been doing nothing. And of course, if you look at the FTSE for Good model under the climate change, under the E pillar, climate change is a big one. And we know that with most rating models as well, they have evolved to include the TCFD recommendations over time. So again, not new in the market and different ways in which that has come into the market via CDP, via TCFD. So all the mainstream kind of ratings and frameworks have adopted TCFD and those have come through via where those have been prevalent in the market. But so that has been very interesting for us. Now, 
on TCFD in specific. And, and thank you also for mentioning the work that we've done. Um, and uh, you know we're still at the early stages of our work, but we're progressing very rapidly. So when we look at that, we, we realize that it's easy to take comfort because um, you know we've got this long history, we're seeing tangible results. Is there a need to do more? But when we look at the profile of the companies and we look at, for example, uh, the ESG ratings that are performed on those, those are kind of the top 100 companies. What happens to your fat tail at, underneath that, right? And all of those companies. Now, a big issue that often companies face is that when they have the resources to do this and big teams and sustainability, they're more likely to obviously have better reporting in the market. But what happens to the rest that don't necessarily have those resources? We're completely cognizant of the world that's just come out. It's coming out of a pandemic that has devastated economies that has in many instances decimated smaller companies, their resources are seriously impacted. Do we run the risk of actually going back on the agenda and losing gains that we've had because of the real challenges that companies face? So what we decided is that we, we really do see a gap for us to be able to help listed companies further than what we have. And so have now embarked on a project to simultaneously issue a sustainability or ESG disclosure guidance and a climate disclosure guidance effectively as a double click under that. So very ambitious to try to do both at the same time, uh, but that's the project that we're on currently. Uh, we're in the early phases, we've had initial consultations and the, the plan is that we will go live with public uh, consultations towards the end of November. So we're in the process now of a rapid development phase supported by the IFC. Um, so we're very grateful for that and the, and the purview that the IFC is giving us as well from the global networks being able to participate in that development process. So that is what we're doing. And I think on the local nuances, I've mentioned already some of the context in which we operate. And what can the exchange do in relation to that local nuance is to try to be the bridge between what is happening in the broader regulatory context in the country, in the broader policy context in the country, and then what does that translate to for the companies listed on the exchange? We also have a number of multinationals that are listed on the JSE. They are already exposed to regulation and policy that's coming out in other jurisdictions. And so how do we help them bridge that gap and also take the rest of the market along? Because the other thing is that there's a bigger play, which is that you want to attract uh, foreign direct investment into your market. And that FDI is increasingly becoming incumbent by restrictions and, and qualifications that are related to sustainability. And so it is fundamental for the market that we consider these things. So I will I will leave it at that then, Martina, and I'm sure we'll have more questions later. Thank you. Thank you, Shamila. I think, uh, you know, I, I do hope that when uh, the um, sustainability reporting standards will be introduced, that the, they will build on the, the experience, the wealth of experience that you have in, in South Africa to make sure that they are localized and and make sure for, uh, you know, make sense for your market. So thank you for sharing this uh, with you, with us, sorry. Uh, Liam Sim, uh, let's go to you now. Uh, you were the vice chair of the TCFD when it was still a task force and active in promoting its uptake in the exchange community. What do you think is the reason for the TCFD success? Why is it attracting the level of support that it has? It's been really incredible to see the, the exponential growth in terms of the adoption levels. Thank you for this opportunity to talk about the TCFD. It uh, was and is still a task force, and that was our task to uh, recommend how to disclose climate-related financials. And as for the reasons for its success, usually there are internal and external, and let me start with the internal. I think very key is that it's a market solution by market practitioners for market practitioners. And by that, if you just look at what is asked for, start with policy or if you like strategy, company strategy, and then risk, how they manage risks, supported by metrics and the targets that you seek to achieve. And, and in addition, governance, because you do need governance to make sure that it's carefully managed, managed all the time and long-term. These are how you run a business. So the disclosures are about businesses. And within that, if you look at um, strategy, how is your strategy panning out? Is it going to be resilient as a transition in the transition from higher to lower carbon economy? And how about scenarios that come about? Scenarios are what companies understand. We've all heard about 
optimistic scenarios and pessimistic scenarios when we do our business plans. So it's about what businesses deal with and are aware of. Hence, it is something that's familiar to them and they can relate to it and take it and run as it were. The financial implications of that, use of capital, isn't that what investors want to know about as they do their plans and as they assess the company and how well the company is doing and going to do the quality of the management, hence this importance of governance. So in a way, this is a market solution. And then in order to deliver this, uh, you can see that a lot has been drawn from existing uh, reporting practices. You can see sustainability reporting practices embedded into the TCFD recommendations. So companies don't have to learn a whole new way of doing things, but they can adapt and use what they already know to bring to bear on this climate, which is, if you like, a new uh, concentration of attention. And I, I think that's easily relevant. Not that they're not asked to do something new. They are asked to do more. But these are additional steps rather than transplanting into something totally different. And then I'd like to introduce the word uh, decision useful. This is something we always ask ourselves within TCFD. Every time we have an ask, is this decision useful? It's like lean and spare. We ask for what is necessary. There's no extras built in because we do realize companies have to put up resources to make these disclosures. So I think it's these disciplines within the what is recommended that helps its, um, its uh, adoption and it makes it easier to adopt. Then again, you look at external factors. So other entities, and uh, David quoted TPI and people like that, have taken the, the TCFD framework and extended its use. So that made it more relevant. And um, thanks to those people, as well as the, uh, the, the um, expert assistance in terms of uh, providing, say, definitions or extending some of the concepts and uses that made it technically um, help the technical adoption and the understanding for different sectors. And that is still going on. So you can see that it's a live matter. And I believe that too makes it relevant. So you can see that every year TCFD has produced an adoption report. And along the way, also additional guidance in the light of what is known and what is learned to make that adoption um, uh, more, uh, to facilitate that adoption by the, by the companies. And I suppose last of all, you know, if we look around ourselves, uh, we can see hotter and hotter uh, years go by. We can see forest fires, we can see rising sea levels, etc. I think that too, what is happening in the environment has also contributed to say, this is necessary, we need to know, and we need to act. Thank you so much for this. And I agree with you, decision useful, I think is key and, and a lot of the, you know, what we're, we're trying to achieve here. Thank you for this. And now we'll go for Mar Mardi. Uh, so CDSB has been a critical supporter and enabler of the TCFD since its launch and a valuable partner to the SEC in rolling out its model guidance. What is the future for CDSB and where do you go from here? Wow, it's such a big question, but I'm so happy to be hearing the words decision useful right now. And because of just a couple of, I mean, we've got decision useful in our mission and it's been there since 2007. But a few months back, I, I kind of just lost it because everyone I spoke to wasn't thinking about that word. So we actually published a paper on what decision useful information actually is in line with TCFD. And it's on the TCFD Knowledge Hub for anyone out there that would like to have a look at it or drop me an email and I'll send it to you. Brilliant. I'm, I'm so happy we've talked about that so much from the beginning. But I'm going to jump back in. So first of all, say thank you to Martine and Dr. Anthony Miller 
for your team's support because that training we have been delivering with the exchanges for the last few months and we will be delivering for a few more mm -hmm. is, is having such great feedback and we're seeing really great appetite for more and more from the market for it so thank you for all of your team's efforts my you know and my team for stepping up yeah and putting together such a high quality program so the future i mean the future for cdsb we've heard from jonathan a little bit about you know, the International Sustainability Standards Board and the IFRS's direction of travel. And we were set up, you know, all those years ago in 2007 in the absence of an internationally agreed and authoritative approach to reporting financially material climate and in later years, ESG information to capital markets via the mainstream corporate report and accounts. And then like other standard setters, our purpose wasn't actually to exist forever. <laughs> Ours was really just to fill a gap. And the TCFD coming along and taking our principles and requirements, which we were terribly um, flattered by, it was the purpose. It, it was the first step to almost, you know, us almost being able to sunset and say, job done, except they only went as far as climate. And as Leanne Simpson earlier, they weren't a plan, planning to stay around forever either. So, you know, we had to keep going. And, uh, I, I think, as Jonathan said, and we've touched on today, you know, the IS, the ISSB, the potential establishment we have our fingers crossed in a few weeks at COP, the announcement what will happen, is is, a, is a, you know another really important step in us achieving our mission. And if it is successfully launched, you know, I, I can expect my board to say that we will be sunsetting CDSB and handing our IP and framework over to the new board to help them with their running start. So for me, again, that's quite exciting. I, I actually quite like the idea of sunsetting and wrapping up an NGO and standard setter. It's never done in this space. So, you know, I like to break new ground and I'm really looking forward again, fingers crossed for that happening. So we, um, I've been participating in the technical readiness working group, helping to facilitate this chance that's getting, you know, all this valuable work that we've been talking about today that already exists together in a package to give the new standards board and, and give it that kickstart little boost that it needs to really get it moving at the pace and scale that we all know we've all talked about today that it that it needs to and that will build as Jonathan alluded to off the work of the TCFD and if you look at the climate prototype that was released by the group of five that Jonathan touched on in in December last year it, you know it very much builds you know, the work we've been preparing builds off that so TCFD is at the center of that work so you know for those that haven't started on tcfd i think the, the message there is is to get started because it's going to catch up with you one way or another um and for those wanting to go but on climate but around the same four pillars of tcfd cdsb's framework can help you do that and our guidance we already have detailed guidance in this space you know aligned to tcfd on water biodiversity has just finished consultation and will be launched on the 30th of november and we have social issues that are currently underway as well. And, and, and why that is important, if you think I'm sunsetting CDSB, is because the ISSB won't have these standards straight away. So we need to continue to use this information to move the market, to get the market prepared for what is coming over the next few years. So it's a very exciting time, very excited space. But what does this mean more broadly, you know, beyond, beyond CDSB? I, I think it, it definitely means the death of an alphabet soup. For those that have hid behind the alphabet soup, there is nowhere left to hide. You might regret what you uh, what you wished for. It, we will be kicking down the walls of the silos between the sustainability comms marketing functions that tend to look after sustainability information in businesses and really integrating them up with their finance friends, their internal controls. You know, we're going to bring some real rigor and discipline to something that pretend, you know, hasn't always had, had the same level of treatment. I think we're going to see an increased reporting of financial impacts and climate uh, climate and other ESG issues in a consistent, comparable decision useful way to markets on an area where TCFD is currently you know, really struggling to get it. It's that connectivity into the financials that is still really falling short with TCFD reporting today. And, and, and that is where that's where the money is, right? That, that's where the rubber hits the road when the narrative is great. But, you know, what does that mean? What is what's the what what, what is that in financial terms? Um, and what does that mean? You know, net zero commitments with money, you know, we're actually going to cost money. And what does this mean? We really want to see some more of that. Um, and for issues that aren't embracing, you know, the frameworks and approaches, you I would, you know, I can only urge you as my closing message to, to get started. Like I said, get started on TCFD, get started on CDSB, get started on SASB's metrics. Think about the connectivity from integrated reporting. Have a look at the WEF IBC cross-cutting metrics. All of these initiatives have been involved in the, the prototype last year and the presentation standard. 
that we're prepared for the ISSB, whether they take it or not, that's their choice. But it's uh, it's all being prepared. And, you know, I, I, Jonathan and his team of IOSCO have given us a lot of important feedback to help shape that so far as our gift. And these things sewn together will help form that, that global baseline. And I rest assured you, it's not a low global baseline. This is this is quite a, a this is, you know, when people talk about, oh, a low, low, it's not a low baseline. This is a really robust baseline based on existing work in the market. So my message to everyone, if you're in exchange, think about, you know, what, you, what you're asking for now and, and what that might look like in the future and how you can help move your issues. And if you're an issuer on the call today, please make sure that you just get started. And, and as a basis for starting, the TCFD Knowledge Hub has an awful lot of good resources and free training courses, as are the program offered by the IFC and CDSB and the Stock Exchange Initiative. So I'll leave it there, Martina, and look forward to questions. Thank you. So yes, we need to get ready. I think we hear you loud and clear. A lot of changes coming on the horizon. Um, my, next, my next question is for those of you uh, working at, at an exchange. So for David, Shamila, and uh, Lian Sim. Uh, disclosure is obviously a very important part of the net zero transition, but it's not the same as action. So what else should um, exchange do to mobilize action? I'm happy to start if, that, if that's helpful. Um, so, yeah, I mean, Let's, I mean, firstly, the disclosure isn't sorted yet. So first step, I think every exchange does need to back TCFD and push out the disclosure guidance. So let's not, so let's, yeah, that is a kind of a prerequisite. Um, we've got the clear, you know, clear guidance thanks to TCFD and that is reflected in our model guidance, the SSE's model guidance. Everyone should get on it and, and get out clear guidance to their issues. Um, within that, one of the sections is setting net zero targets. So it's not just about disclosure, it is also about get organized and set a credible net zero target. I really welcome actually, um, and thanks to Lian Simio for her work on TCFD, I really welcome the latest uh, TCFD update, which has got much more focus around um, what are good targets, um, what, you know, and more, and, and making sure that there is clear, um, uh, um, and consistent ways in setting targets. It's very difficult for investors in the finance sector when every company sets targets in completely different ways and isn't clear about the real definitions of its targets, you know, base year, end year, is it absolute emissions, is it normalized emissions, et cetera. I think we can also go further, and that's what we tried to do yesterday, which was actually telling companies what we think of of how well they're moving on this agenda so that so that was giving them all this kind of private climate governance score which is based effectively off tcfd it's 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 using the tpi methodology and as the you just mentioned uh, tpi is is based off tcfd and so it takes the so basically you know, it looks at things like you know has a company got senior executives responsible for climate? Is it reporting on its emissions? Has it got short and long-term targets? Is it setting an internal price for carbon? Is it linking this to executive remuneration, et cetera? So there's a lot of the kind of governance type mechanisms and companies are put on a score between zero, one, two, three, or four. So fairly simple, depending on how far along that it's going. Um, and so what we've, and I think that's the foundations then for coming up with these credible and hard targets and driving decarbonization. Um, that's obviously what, what really matters is ultimately what kind of targets a company setting and then are they delivering on those. But to get to that, you've got to have the right foundations for action. And I think what we what we can be doing is, yes, focusing on disclosure, but also then really encouraging companies to step up, get the foundations in place and then start setting credible targets. Thank you. So Shamila, you want to go next? Thank you. Tina, happy, to, happy to, to add on and completely concur with the David's points. The other areas I think exchanges can help in facilitating action ties to something I mentioned earlier about uh, bridging that gap, you know, between what is happening on national agenda and then understanding your market, uh, you know, your sectors and, and being able to try make that connection for them. So I think there's a huge opportunity there because there's still a lot of language that people need to get used to. You know, there's a country NDC and then there's a net zero target and your country might not have already committed to net zero and your NDC is a different pathway to what you kind of want here. So there's opportunity to help facilitate those conversations that make it easier for companies to understand and then start 
helping them to translate that into action and also helping them to see that they don't need to wait and say, well, you know, at a national level, for example, there's maybe slightly less ambition. And so what does that mean for me? Um, but actually sharing with them, you know, that this is a, there's a burning platform. There's a need to do this anyway. And this is how it, it's going to impact, you know, possibly your ability to access finance in the longer term, those sorts of things. And then the other arm that an exchange can lever to be able to help is to, obviously, of course, the instruments, right? You have instruments that you have developed. And so there's the instruments and services that you offer that can facilitate that. So, you know, are you making those easily accessible? Uh, you know, there's always often for exchanges, there's kind of this tension between does the market want it or should I build it and they'll come, you know? And so those are the kind of conversations you want to have at strategic level as an exchange to be able to say, well, what should I be facilitating? And sometimes I'm going to have to take a bet that if I build it, they're going to come and I'm creating it when I when they see that it can happen then this is going to facilitate the capital and reallocation, for example. So there's that Eva as well. So there's, an, there's quite a bit that we can do in advocacy, in engagement, in the products and the services, and of course, in, in, the, in the disclosure and things like that, making it easier for that data to be accessible, helping them to understand, well, what is decision useful? You know, um, These are the things that uh, I think exchanges are well-placed to play a significant role in. I've also seen from local context experience that uh, uh, it's become more incumbent on us to engage with the more nationally, you know, with the regulatory, what is happening on there, the policy conversations and things like that, to, to constantly be one of the voices for a market perspective as well, and being able to make that connection. Um, and, and I find that that's been quite useful. And often as the exchange, we've been welcomed into those conversations and, and have that opportunity to, to influence those decisions. So certainly in South Africa, I'm seeing that those processes are, uh, are, are inclusive of most actors in the financial system. And so those are other opportunities that I think one can look to because that's that will be the bedrock for action going forward once you have clarity on a number of those things. And there's an element where action is happening already and there's another element where you're building the platform for that to enable that action hopefully quicker than it would have happened without your presence in that conversation. Thank you for May this. May I add something on yes, uh, the course. people? Um, I think the people aspect is also important. Uh, the exchange, uh, because of a central role, we kind of able to touch various participants in the market. So um, I think, first of all, we need to make sure that the board members of our listed companies all get the message clearly and that they understand. So um, having, having um, giving them the opportunity, whether we do it ourselves or somebody else does it, but, you know, making sure that there's so what we call training, but really it's awareness that it's a business issue and therefore they must be, must understand and know and be able to get around this issue. I think that's very important because if they get the message, then at least the driving of the company is in the correct direction. Then I think also on the investor side, it's, it's critical that investors um, get their message through. Um, you know, as a regulator or former regulator, companies do pay attention to us, but they love to hear from their investors. That's different from listening to the regulator where they have to. So I think investors, you know, like PRI or even other uh, investor organizations, um, not just having the statements, but really, um, getting down to what it is they look at and why they look at it, or having the engagement, or having the questions at the AGM. I think these are things that really touch the company directly, and they can, they can respond to it more clearly than anything the regulator, the exchange would say many times. And then I think the, the last one is maybe the accountants. Because accountants are in every company. And if accountants understand better, if they get the message and they are themselves motivated to push it, I think it will move faster. And if they don't understand or they're not minded to come along, I think they can slow the pace quite significantly. So um, sometimes, you know, when we talk to our listed companies and you ask and you see those who have moved things rapidly, quite often you can see that the finance function is behind it as well, 
although it does, um, they also say that it takes um, cooperation between the business and the, you know, and the sustainable and the regulatory side and the compliance and so on. But it does, that is very important too. But I think that the finance function as something we can look at and that usually they have um, some local um, association or some, uh, you know, auditing or, or counting body and they could work on this as well. I think it would be very useful. Thank you for this. Can, can I just add 10 answer. seconds yes. more? Yes, which, is, which is just really building on the, on, on my, my, my two colleagues, what they just said. And uh, I think maybe you haven't come across clearly enough. Investors in the finance sector are shifting capital. And if, and, and this is in companies invest their own interests. If they don't, if they can't set out what their transition plans are, they are going, I mean, as Shamili just said, they will, they will find it very difficult raising capital. Um, and so we have a, a duty really to help issuers understand that and get prepared and ready for those potentially quite difficult sometimes investor and finance conversations. A very good point, uh, David, in terms of capital allocation. I'm being mindful of the time. We have about six minutes left. So maybe the next question I'll ask Jonathan and, and Mardi to, to answer. Um, you know, like a part of the, the, the great support that we've seen for the IFRS uh, sustainable uh, uh, reporting um, guidelines is the hope that they will standardize sustainability reporting. But one of the challenges we've already seen is, is some of divergence in approach between the IFRS focus on sustainability factors that may impact enterprise value and the EU uh, focus on double materiality. So what do you guys think about this and how can this be managed? I will let Marty perhaps elaborate more on the details uh, as she has been very much uh, breeding <laughs> the, the technical preparations there. But if I can kick off, uh, uh, you know, I think we, we, we all acknowledge the societal expectations and not just that, but also the need for capital markets to contribute, you know, critically to, to this uh, pathway. What we have done is, and I also is encourage a modular building blocks approach. Uh, and we will encourage international consensus. And we still very much hope that jurisdictions will coalesce around this notion of a baseline, a very high baseline as Mahdi mentioned as the first block. This can be complemented by other blocks, uh, which you know can focus on the wider sustainability impacts and other disclosures that go beyond the initial ISSB's enterprise value creation uh, orientation. And this may be um, um, jurisdiction specific, at least at the inception. But uh, you know there is a journey as well there. Let's don't water down, undermine the progress that we have made so far. I was referring before in present tense to the existing challenges and shortcomings in the current ecosystem. If we have been able to move the dial uh, from voluntary to mainstream, if we are, if we are uh, able to group around this notion of uh, a baseline, uh, you know, we, we think this is something that, that can evolve. And I think actually the fashion in which the European um, you know, Union builds and complements from the baseline uh, and constructs comprehensively may actually provide a roadmap for those jurisdictions that you know, are not ready yet to go the extra mile, but will be exploring this path uh, very soon. So uh, uh, we're all having our eyes on how you know, the, 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 the both you know, read into each other, but you know, maybe Marty has a bit more insight into that. And I think you did a brilliant job. I think, I think most importantly, though, I, companies have been thinking about impact materiality and materiality to stakeholders beyond the finance, financial perspective for quite some time. GRI's G1 came out, what, 20, 2000? Companies have been thinking about this. They know what they're doing. I think it's very important companies think about telling one story and one story only to all of its stakeholders. And, and that can work with the building blocks approach. And that's where we go wrong now and why people are getting lost in double materiality, dynamic materiality, there's too many, right? Where we're getting lost in the words. I think what is really important is companies tell one clear, consistent, comparable story to all of their stakeholders, including their financial stakeholders, because now I can pick up a sustainability report, a TCFG report, SASB standards, uh, an annual report and accounts, and maybe a CDP disclosure and none of that aligns. Nothing in there, not one of those reports actually tells me a consistent story about a company. And what I need to see is one clear report 
that tells me the same thing across you know, what would basically just tells or connects all those things together with one you know if it's material financial material it's there if it's material for more broader stakeholders i know where to find it so i that you know i think that's the way to go Thank you, Margie. Uh, we have about two minutes left, so maybe what I would like to do is, is uh, highlight some of my, my key takeaways, or I would say my key words, right? I think uh, a journey and building block, very important. I think we need to start somewhere. We need to have action. It doesn't need to be perfect, but we need to, to start having uh, those reporting standards and how data is very important in terms of allowing investors uh, to make uh, to to integrate this um, information and make a decision useful for capital allocation. So I think uh, I mean these for me are, are the you know the top takeaways. But also how exchanges is, you know are supporting some of this uh, uh, some of this work. I think it's going to be very very important in the coming years uh, to see all market participants, regulators, exchanges, uh, standard setters really stepping up to the plate and helping companies. Uh, report consistently so we are able to integrate that information and facilitate that transition and allocate resources where our planet is going to be able to survive. And I think, you know, the next frontier that I see, this is really much related to the E of ESG is, will there be something also, you know, as strong on the social side? I think we've seen with COVID how, you know, social aspects are very important to also integrate in our investment decisions. So maybe that's the next frontier and maybe who knows next year or in the two years from now, we'll be able to have a, a panel discussion uh, on that uh, topic. So I want to thank you all uh, for your participation today and sharing your insights and knowledge with uh, um, all the participants to the panel. Thank you. And thank you, Martine, for moderating that discussion. It was an excellent discussion where I think we got to cover a lot of these topics. Obviously, it's a very rich area and I think we could have kept going for another hour. But um, uh, I really appreciated the inputs of everybody. Um, and uh, some of you we will be seeing in COP26 in just a few weeks. Uh, this remains a very dynamic area and uh, we all look forward to following it uh, together. Thank you. And thank you to all the participants who tuned in today. Thanks, this concludes the session. Thank you, goodbye. Thank you very thank much. You. Bye. Bye. Thank you.